Olivia. 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 Where are you? We have to record the podcast. The people need to know about strange medieval fellas. There you are, for fuck's sake. Ah! You surprised me! Jesus Christ. <laughs> My God, you have a loud... That's, I didn't see you there. It's like a harpy. Jesus ah. Christ. What are you reading? Funny you should ask. Is it? I'm reading the new Weird Medieval Guys book. A what? That's right. There's a Weird Medieval Guys book. It's not out yet. I'm holding one of the few copies in existence in my hand. I'm gonna sell this on eBay. No! No, my baby! Bring her back! The feast is all. Now brimming wine in lordly cup is seen to shine before each eager guest. And silence fills the crowded hall, as deep as when the herald's call thrills in the loyal breast. That's right. That may have been a joke sketch, but there is a weird medieval guy's book coming out over the past year. I have been busting my ass writing a book that's coming out on November 2nd um, via Square Peg, an uh, imprint of Penguin Vintage in the UK, but you can get it worldwide. You can pre-order it now. It's a great book. It's called Weird Medieval Guys, How to Live, Laugh, Love, and Die in Dark Times, and it's a sort of guide, medieval guide to life, if you will. Both a guide to life in the Middle Ages and a medieval guide to living now. So it's got loads of fun content in it, loads of fun facts. It's got medieval vocabulary. It's got quizzes, personality quizzes, like how will you die and can you get a divorce? It's got information about animals and love and everything else you need to know in your life. Um, so I'll drop a link in the episode notes, but yeah, if you love my Twitter and you love our podcast and you want something physical that you can hold in your hands, then either Stroke. then either give Aaron a call or buy my Wait, book. Wait, no, don't call me. <laughs> I want the record to show I had no part in this. <laughs> I do not want to steal any value. This is not me. I'm just some guy. I don't even I don't even have the login to the Twitter account. That's true. Yeah. I'm just a man who comes to her house sometimes. <laughs> That's right. Welcome back to the Weird Medieval Guys podcast. I'm Olivia, and this is Aaron, a man who came to my house to record this yeah. podcast. We've got some lovely, I don't know if you can hear this, if, this, if the mics are picking this up, we're getting some lovely rain ASMR, thanks to the torrential August downpour. Yeah, unfortunately, because we record these, like, sitting on my living room floor, which is also my kitchen floor... Um, yeah, we've got... We've London got a bit housing of, market's great, The everybody. London housing market is absolutely wonderful, so, yeah. Um, in, enjoy the atmosphere. Yeah, if, if you want to re if you really want to get into the spirit of it, just, like, imagine you're sitting in a nice plush armchair. The rain is rattling the windows. Wow. There's a, there's a golden retriever at your feet. Aww. You stroke the golden retriever. You pet the golden, you poke the golden retriever in the jowls. It doesn't like that very much, but it loves you anyway, so. Your mom comes in. She says, you need to clean your room. You're like, shut it up. Looks like I'm playing with the there. dog. <laughs> it looks like you live like this. Get out of my room, no mom. No wonder you got no bitches. What? That is, I have a girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> shut up, son. She lives in Wales. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. My girlfriend was swallowed by a whale. <laughs> Thanks for bringing it up. <laughs> this is a stupid show. I know. So, you summoned me to your kitchen floor uh, to talk about what exactly? To talk about the medieval world, and more specifically, the medieval world's relationship with the classical world. In a more sort of uh, algorithm-friendly way of putting it, how stupid were these people? Yeah. So what did they actually know? So I've posted a few pictures um, on my Twitter account of pictures from drawings from medieval manuscripts, uh, medieval manuscripts about the classical world. So history manuscripts about Julius Caesar or Cleopatra, 
or similar characters, and one thing that often comes up is why do all Why aren't they wearing togas? Why weren't they wearing togas or chitons or um, any other sort of clasp garb? Why you know, is, keep listening things. Why is Julius Caesar wearing like tight hose and a floppy hat? Why it looks is hot. Cleopatra wearing an ermine lined dress? Because it looks hot. Yeah, that's true actually. She looked like it she was a bad bitch. Drip. Um Yeah. Um and and usually what people say is, well, medieval people, they were just so stupid. They had no idea how people in the classical world dressed or what they looked like. Or maybe people say, oh, they weren't stupid, but they were just ignorant. They had no way of knowing. And so Usually they, were... they pin this down. Usually people, like, make the connection to the burning of the Library of Alexandria, I've yeah. noticed. When we burned the Library of Alexandria, which had all of... didn't burn all of the copies of Egyptian Vogue in it. <laughs> we lost all of that knowledge about how Egyptian people dressed. So how did uh, medieval people portray the classical past then? Well, so it wasn't just about clothing. They portrayed the classical past as being very similar to the medieval world. In fact, almost indistinguishable from the medieval world. So even sort of the rites and rituals and day-to-day -day life of people from ancient Greece and ancient Rome so, for instance, when they show Julius Caesar's wedding, they show it as a Christian wedding officiated by a church official. When they show Alexander the Great's coronation, he's being crowned by a pope. <laughs> they didn't have popes back in... They didn't even have Jesus. They didn't have Jesus. He was not... He had not been born yet. So, and there's, there's many, many examples of this. And there's basically no drawings from medieval manuscripts of people from the Greek and Roman world wearing things like togas and chitons that are sort of historically accurate, so to speak, or things that we knew people, that we know people in that time period actually wore. Which is fascinating, because it's not like material culture from the classical period didn't survive. Yeah, so I think what people think when they see this is that material culture from the Greek and the Roman world didn't survive, and that medieval people simply had no way of knowing how these people dressed. So do you want to know my, my, my completely unhinged pet theory as to why, we, why, uh, why people sort of make that assumption? Mm -hmm. It's because, again, I think this is not based on anything but vibes. Yeah. I think it's because um, English language scholarship on um, the transitional period from the Roman world to the to the medieval world is, I think, overly colored by the experience of Britain in the post-Roman world. Britain left the Roman Empire much earlier and on very different terms than the rest of, of the European world. Like Britain, I think the, the last legions left Rome in, I think, 410. And what happened afterwards was this essentially sort of mini apocalypse <laughs> where people sort of retreated from the big Roman villas and, and from the big towns and sort of returned to a less economically complex world. And of course, lots of material, even in Britain, lots of material culture survived in Rome. I mean, that's why birth is so lovely. But like, it's a, it was a particularly dramatic decline in Britain that kind of makes Britain an outlier in, in the post-Roman world. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think I think if we're going to ask sort of why people think this, then I think we also need to ask, is it true? Did medieval people know what the classical world was like? How much of an idea did they have of the classical world, how people dressed, how people behaved, um, what sorts of, you know, religious practices people had? So I think, yeah, I think it's worth asking how much did survive from the Roman Empire? and the Greek um, and the Greek world. And I think it's worth asking, you know, if our assumption is that medieval people had no access to these primary sources, how is it that all of these things were supposedly rediscovered when the Renaissance took place? So I think that sort of leads us to the idea that maybe there were things surviving from the classical world, maybe even things that people from in the Middle Ages would have engaged with and would have had knowledge of that would have given them insight into the fact that Julius Caesar did not get married in a tuxedo and his wife did not wear a medieval ermine gown. For listeners at home, I've been making an increasingly pained expression at Olivia ever since she said the words, uh, 
survive basically said that things that were surviving the fall of the Roman Empire because one of the things that survived the fall of the Roman Empire was the Roman fucking Empire. And this is the first point <laughs> that I think <laughs> needs to get made. There were still Romans. The Romans didn't go away. Like they didn't just vanish. They were again, this is this is part of the reason why I think the, the British example is unrepresentative because Brit the Roman Empire literally left um, literally left Britain. Like it's like its institutions and its people, by and large, left. Well, I think the question is for me, like, how would people have known about what life was like in the classical worlds? They would have to know from, as you said, material culture what was left behind. So I think we can take a look at a few of the things that were left behind by the classical worlds. So before we get into the massive um, sort of issue of texts and written things, I think it's also worth noting that a lot of art survived, right? Statues and sculptures and engravings and mosaics and so on. So the Romans made this stuff. The reason know. why we have all the stuff from the Roman Empire, yes, it's partially because archaeology got really good in the modern period, but it's also because stuff that survived to the present day would have to have, by definition, survived the Middle Ages. Yeah, exactly. And this isn't just because the medieval people forgot to destroy some, <laughs> some pagan statues, right? So lots and lots and lots of Roman things did survive because people in the Middle Ages thought that these, you know, beautiful marble sculptures were beautiful because they were examples of incredible craftsmanship. Mm -hmm. Now, definitely they weren't all sort of treated with respect and you know many of them were altered in different ways so for instance sort of a medieval favorite was to take these sculptures and knock the heads off and replace them with heads of saints and religious figures um so you keep the body get a new head so that's probably not something that we would consider to be like respecting and preserving culture now it's more what we would consider to be frankenstein yeah a little bit but but there are many examples of people respecting and valuing these things that were left behind. There's a great story I read about a medieval, I think he was a bishop from England who went on a trip to Rome and said, oh, to the Romans, he saw a bunch of Roman statues that they had out and he said, no, 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 you guys can't have those out. These are pagan idols. You need to give these all to me. I'm going to take them back to England. <laughs> <laughs> so it is true that some Roman um, art and Greek art was considered to be sort of pagan iconography and many a lot of it was destroyed or discarded um, or sort of otherwise disregarded. Medieval people love to have like a bout of idolatry. Yeah. Like there will be like a it, would, it was very much a fad yeah. that people would go through like for like a decade or so and everybody would and then everybody would sort of come off the high and go that was a bit stupid, wasn't it? Well, yeah, exactly. You had like, that was embarrassing. You had like Charlemagne <laughs> being like, "Oh, we're gonna bring back like you know classical thinking in like the eighth or ninth century or whatever." The Carolingian like, Renaissance. Yeah, the Carol. And then it's like, okay, we have a couple hundred years of that. And then I, actually, no, let's do our own thing. Um, so the the pendulum keeps swinging. The pendulum keeps swinging, and so so. But I think it's it's important to say that people would not have. I don't think it's. I don't think we can conclusively prove that the average person would have no idea what, say, a toga looked like or what, you know, a Greek or Roman person looked like, because these statues were very present. But of course, the people who are writing these texts and these histories of the classical world aren't the average person. They're scholars. Mm, and so those bastards. <laughs> hate them. Historic. <laughs> and in order to write these histories of people like Caesar, they must have been working from texts and sources about Caesar from the classical worlds. Mm -hmm. So there definitely was a preservation of classical texts. I mean, the amount of texts that were preserved as opposed to destroyed, I don't think we can ever know, but I would say a fraction. It's it's absolutely true to say that so much was destroyed. And this isn't a unique this isn't unique to the transition out of the Roman period. I mean, a fraction of medieval manuscripts survived. Yeah, because people in the Renaissance didn't see illuminated manuscripts as products of a bygone era. 
they saw them as old shit as old things and that were crap <laughs> there wasn't necessarily yeah. <laughs> exactly and sort of you know beyond that there were so many illuminated manuscripts by the end of the middle ages that it didn't necessarily feel like they were like there was a huge scarcity it was ten of fucking they were threatened and it was very similar i think when people slowly stopped writing in latin and greek on rolls of papyrus mm. and medieval scholars um and this is this is us beating around the bush a little bit but we need to address the fact that whilst the classical period as we know it sort of ended at the, in the sort of uh, in the 5th century the roman empire did not as we've talked about before on this show the roman empire was still around <laughs> there was a state centered in everybody say it with me constantinople bingo um which historians like to call the byzantine empire because it's a useful de demarcation between two periods but in every meaningful sense in terms of self-identification in terms of at least initially institutions um in terms of initially the sort of state language it's the roman empire so even if we assume that everywhere else in Europe, uh, when the when the Roman Empire sort of dissolves in Western Europe in the in the fifth century, um, everybody stops caring about Rome. Everything everything sort of disintegrates, right? The whole legacy is gone. Everybody forgets. Okay. Even if that were the case, on the other side of the continent, the Romans are still there, and they very much st still call themselves Romans, and they're very much still connected to what they see as an unbroken chain of um of roman inheritance right and that's not to say the byzantines were always great at preserving uh roman texts they especially in the sort of seventh and eighth centuries when they were really having a hard time of it where they were losing really badly to the arabs and the, and the bulgars they were just like i don't have time to copy manuscripts we're trying to do a war <laughs> Yep. And then, of course, in, in, the, in the 8th century, they kind of bounce back. In fact, there's this kind of, through the entire Byzantine history, there's this kind of uh, seesaw, essentially, where um, Byzantines will occasionally, in, in the Byzantines, especially in times of sort of crisis, and as, as a way to sort of restore uh, national pride, would suddenly get very into the Roman past. Yeah. And start sort of, you know, re like writing a lot more about Caesar and all the other Caesars. Yeah, but it's important to note that people in both Eastern and Western Europe at this point, sort of the direct aftermath of the fall of Rome, they weren't thinking of it as a bygone era. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, Byzantine scholars, the reason why they were copying down these texts from papyrus scrolls was to study them and to share them with other people and to make copies of them. It wasn't because they saw it as this is bygone history that needs to be preserved for the future. Mm -hmm. I mean... When I was in high school, I used to volunteer in our library, our school library, and because um, I had no friends. My friend was a librarian, Aww. and um, no, she was cool. And we would go through and do what librarians call weeding, which is when you take out all the books that like don't get checked out and are no longer relevant, like, you know, the Windows 95 handbook edition 2.5.6, and you just, throw, you just throw them in the bin. And people... <laughs> And in 500 years, scholars might be saying, well, we could solve the mystery of the 21st century if we had a surviving copy of the Windows 95 handbook, <laughs> volume 2.5.6. <laughs> but at the time, it doesn't feel like knowledge that's relevant or that's threatened. And it's not something that, you know, you think, oh, I really have to preserve, especially because there are so many pieces of papyrus. Mm -hmm. And also, very importantly, Papyrus is really fragile. Yeah, I it mean, just it's, crumbles away. It's essentially dried plants. And when you compare sort of the vellum, the parchment that medieval people were writing on, um, it's so much more robust because it's basically leather and you mm -hmm. prepare it and it can last indefinitely. So that's a really big part of why we have a huge, huge sort of number of, addition, of um, original manuscripts from the Middle Ages, but we have very few original sort of pieces of writing from the classical past. Yeah, and I should say as well, like, we've gotten, we, you, you mentioned that, like, just, like, the process of time weeds out a lot of sort of 
of, of cultural artifacts, we in the modern era, in the digital era, have gotten very, very complacent about, like, preservation. Yes, absolutely. I mean, look at what's going on with streaming platforms. Oh my god. Well, exactly. Like, I promise you this is real. I'm sure none of you have heard of this. I didn't even watch it. But they made a Grease prequel show, and it won an Emmy. But before it won an Emmy, it had already been deleted <laughs> from the streaming service. Like, we live in an age where, because nothing is physical anymore, media isn't physical, you know, in 500 years, if you have a working DVD player, you can get your copy of Pacific Rim, directed by Guillermo del Toro, and you can plug it in and you can watch that. And maybe it's a bit dusty, you have to blow on it a little bit, but you can still watch that. If I want to watch Grease, The Rise of the Pink Ladies, the Emmy nominated, sorry, Emmy award winning television program, I can basically just go fuck myself. Damn. Like, deep, well, DVDs are the- are This the, is a sad day for Grease heads. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Grease is not the word. <laughs> but yeah, no, exactly. And I think sort of on that note, ooh, dramatic roll of thunder, on that note, I think it's important to recognize that actually, so to, to take a step back, I suppose, so people in the East and in the West as well, because Western scholars were much more sort of, I would say, fragmented and disjointed. It wasn't quite as much of a unified scholarly community as there was in the East. Sort well, you're of not the... living in the same, you're not living in a singular state yeah, anymore. Exactly. You're living in like 70 different principalities that are at war with each other <laughs> yep. at any given time. But even those people were, even those scholars in the West were also copying down classical texts. And I think, so I think it's, a, it's important to note that actually the reason why we have most classical texts that we do have is because of medieval people because they were copying them down onto parchment. And making a proactive effort to do so. Yes, so they were preserving them. Um, and actually, in that sense, I think it's worth saying that our perceptions of the classical world are extremely colored by the medieval world, because we have what they wanted and what they saved. Yeah. So we're kind of viewing the classical world in that sense through their lens. So, for instance, they didn't find sort of everything in the classical world, unfortunately, equally interesting. So medieval scholars loved copying down uh, histories, they loved science books, they loved medicinal works. They weren't so keen on poetry, which is why, like, Sappho, there's not that much Sappho still around. Sorry, lesbians. Sorry, lesbians. That's why, like, most Sappho that we have is from, like, parchment fragments. It was, like, not a great time to be a lesbian. <laughs> The, the 8th century. Um, How would you know? There isn't any Sappho left. Yeah, good point. You're right. So, so yeah. So I think it's, it's you know, worth sort of acknowledging our debt to the medieval world. That, mm -hmm. you know, far from being the people who are ignorant of the classical world, they were the people who were transmitting that knowledge forwards. Yeah. And something that I find really, really interesting, actually, is that a lot of the kind of post-medieval renaissance world didn't realize that because they were also sort of not fully informed and not fully in touch with the classical world, even mm -hmm. though the whole idea of humanism in the 15th and the 16th centuries was to deliberately revive classical thinking and classical culture. So they would actually often look at medieval manuscripts and <laughs> medieval texts and think, oh, this is a surviving manuscript from the Romans. Which is highly problematic, because there's nothing that medieval people loved more than adding some bullshit at the start of their book, <laughs> saying, This was passed down from Thucydides. Yep, exactly. And uh, of, I think a big part of that was because actually, um, in the early Middle Ages, there was sort of a very different style of handwriting to the sort of traditional like gothic black letter, you know, very hard to read text that we associate with the Middle Ages. So actually handwriting in like the 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th centuries was very easy to read. And Renaissance scholars looked at that handwriting and thought, oh, this must be handwriting from the Roman world. We're going to model our handwriting on it. So actually the reason why we have the fonts that developed and like the typefaces, like Times New Roman, which is kind of the <gasps> symbol of like erudite. Um, it's like, you it's know. the font you use when you're want to when you you've got an essay that you know is is a C at best, and you want to sort of push up the 
the vibe. Exactly. Into something a bit more professional. Exactly. And the lower Ariel won't cut it. Exactly. Yeah. And the the a lot of the letters from that are basically taken from the early Middle Ages. So this isn't like a pure Roman sort of style of handwriting. It's actually very, very medieval. But scholars in the 16th century didn't realize that. And I think that it's worth noting that not only were they sort of they weren't just sort of passively passing things on their culture was and the sort of um literary conventions and uh styles of writing and things pe people focused on were deeply influenced by classical texts so for example in 1453 we're back there again when uh, when constantinople fell and greeks were writing about uh we're, we're starting to write the first histories of the decline and fall of the byzantine empire and trying to process this sort of apocalyptic trauma. <laughs> <laughs> Writers like Critobulus, who who wrote sort of the first definitive history of that of that period, were actively aping the style of uh, Thucydides, because everybody knows that all proper uh, military histories should be written in the style of Thucydides, who was the, the greatest to ever do it. Yeah. The goat, if you might say. And there's so many examples of these like singularly influential classical sort of scholars and their influence in the Middle Ages. I mean, you have people like, um, you know, Socrates and Aristotle, whose natural history works were basically like the definitive natural history works. You have a lot of people who actually we've kind of like lost favor with now, like Boethius, mm. who wrote about... Um, being in prison and fortune and the we who invented the wheel of fortune i believe um and you don't hear about him the one now from tv he was best friends with alex trebek <laughs> <laughs> and um and yeah and you don't hear about him very much these days but if you were a medieval university student this was like required reading you would be Ugh. intimately familiar with boethius's work so i think we can pretty conclusively say that like all of medieval scholarship was basically founded on classical scholarship. Like, it's not even a question of like, did they know about the Romans? Of course they knew about the yeah. Romans and the Greeks. Like- And the Persians and the Carthaginians and yes, that whole world. They were acutely aware. And of course, by the way, I have to sort of uh, big up the, the Arabs as well, who were also very, very interested in classical texts, got very into copying them down and had their own tradition of preservation. And, and to generalize slightly, to be honest, the Arabs were usually a, a lot less liberal with kind of making, <laughs> making creative, uh, creative, taking creative liberties with the texts. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, just, just a, just a quick uh, shout out to my boys. <laughs> I think that it, yeah, I think that it's important to sort of acknowledge how much medieval people valued the sort of the classical past and classical scholarship. Um, one of my favorite sort of tidbits is comes from a, a 12th century French writer named Cretin de Troy, who um, wrote in the preface of one of his books about the Greeks and the Romans. He said, wait a minute, his name was Cretin de Troy? Yeah. Did the did the irony ever strike him? <laughs> he wrote, no one any longer discusses the Greeks and Romans. Talk of them has receded, and its glowing embers extinguished. Which, on one hand, sounds pretty damning. However, of course, he is kind of talking about them, isn't he? Well, he's talking about the... He's, he's, he's explicitly positioning them within the framework of contemporary debate. Yeah. So he's saying... He is, like, acknowledging that it's part of the cultural landscape. And another author another French author who was one of his contemporaries, her name was Marie de France, or she's called that oh, come on. because the only sort of self-identification she included in her work was, my name is Marie and I'm from France. Typical French woman. Uh, yeah. She wrote, I had begun to think that I might make a good story of the classics and translate from the Latin into French. But such a project would scarcely have benefited me, since it had already been done so much by so many others. Well, talk about pathetic <laughs> fallacy. <laughs> well, I think it's it's interesting that at the ex almost the exact same time, you have these two people. One of them is saying, no one talks about the classics anymore. And one of them is saying, I'm so sick of the classics. Everyone talks about the classics. I'm not going to bother with them. You know what this feels like? It feels like, just just listening to that feels like reading a literature review. <laughs> yeah, so I think 
first of all, I think you can understand Chrétien de Troyes' position a bit more when you realize that this was written in the preface to a book that he had written about the classical worlds. So no one talks about the classics anymore. We have all forgotten about the classics. Except for the people who pay me to make this book. Read my book about the classics. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Nobody talks about the Middle Ages anymore. Yeah, exactly. Listen to our podcast. Anyways, I, I, um, I really like Marie de France's um, work as well. Um, she was a big writer of like fables. She was also quite in sort of influenced by the classics. And um, she I sounds like a queen. I discovered um, sort of the titles of two fables that she wrote. Uh, one was called "The Woman Who Tricked Her Husband." Awesome. <laughs> Another one she wrote later on was called "A Second Time: The Woman Tricked Her Husband." <laughs> And actually, she was she was sort of an author who wrote like exclusively about women tricking men. Yes, which <laughs> which is super cool. Oh God, I hope that she wrote like a whole series. Yeah. Volume, volume five, <laughs> volume woman twelve of wife tricks. Can you believe this? <laughs> Can you believe this husband keeps getting tricked? <laughs> in the in the immortal words of George Bush, "Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice." I can't, you can't fool me again. <laughs> Husband fooling five, Tokyo Drift. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but it's, um, it's like Sharknado. It's like, how what? can, how can, no, they, it make isn't. So many, they make so many Sharknado movies. And it's like, how can this same thing, you think they would have wise, you know, wise how many Sharknado movies are they? they Quite you a think, few. You think that people would have cottoned on to the fact that there's, Sharknados yeah. and avoided them. Where's my phone? Where's the... I want to learn about Sharknado. Don't... I'm Googling this. Okay. Don't take this away from me. They've made at least two Sharknados. Yeah, I... Well, yeah, I know. Six! <laughs> they made six of these? Whoa! On a series of six American made for television science fiction no action way. comedy horror disasters. What? Including a spin off film, Sharknado Heart of Sharkness. <laughs> I'd just like wow. to say, uh, Jason Statham, the Meg series, the ball is in your court. <laughs> Wait, can I, um, can I ask you to read? The list of Sharknado titles. Yes. You're going to need to scroll down to each one. Which voice would you like? Um, I don't know. Pick your poison. Okay. Sharknado. Sharknado 2, the second one. Sharknado 3. Oh, hell no. <laughs> Sharknado, the fourth awakens. Sharknado 5, global swarming. Topical. The last Sharknado. Subtitle. <laughs> it's about time. <laughs> Is that do you the think... last wife trick? <laughs> do you Isn't think that's supposed to be a history show? Do you think it's about time? Is like, do you think that means oh, finally the last Sharknado? Or do you think it's about like the sharks' time travel? <gasps> Wait, hang on. Is it? I don't know. Hang on, hang on. I need to read yeah, the synopsis. Right. We should get back on track. No, <laughs> no. I don't care about the show anymore. Give me that. Wait, wait, wait. A write-up in Bloody Disgusting said, "In wait, the lead is called Finn? His name is Finn Sharkson. Wow. What? Wait, another person is called Gil? Wait, after subduing potential Sharknados in Camelot, the War of Independence, Sorry, what? and the Wild West, Finn is able to destroy the original Sharknado before it could escalate into the global catastrophes he has witnessed. <gasps> oh my god. Creating a new timeline where Finn is still just the bar owner he was in the original film. Wow. They wrote the sh Wow. Sorry, everything, everywhere, all at once. They- Sharknado ate your lunch. That's crazy. Oh my god. I'm sorry, I don't want- <laughs> I'm- I'm so intrigued. Wow. I can't believe their names are Finn and Gil. I can't get past that. Finn, Gil, wow. Tooth. There's another one called Brian. Shark. The group destroy the Sharknado that appears with the help of a pterodactylus tamed by April. Mm. Use a time capacitor built into Gil's flight badge, believing they've erased the Sharknados. 
They meet okay. Merlin, who re reveals he's been helping the past version of Gil. Wow. <laughs> Sharknado forms and heads to the castle, but Finn destroys it with Excalibur. Wait, what? Hang on, how? The group's next jump leads to the American Revolutionary War, where they destroy a Sharknado with aid from George Washington and Benjamin Franklin. Yes, and were they rapping? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. This Probably. is post. This is post Hamilton. I would have expected them to get on that train. Pardon me. Are you Sharknado, sir? <laughs> In a coherent shark noise. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think. Do sharks even make noise? <laughs> Probably not. To be honest. We, okay, right. We sorry. need to. Sorry. <laughs> this is all staying in. Anyways, <laughs> anyways, my point is, um, Marie de what was your work point? is very reminiscent of Sharknado because oh my God. the same issues just keep coming up. You you saw that review call us irreverent, and you were like, "I could give you one better. <laughs> How about irrelevant?" <laughs> that was good. <laughs> So I think the point here is we can say pretty conclusively that scholars, the people who would have been writing and making these manuscripts, knew a darn lot about the classical world. Mm -hmm. So I think then the question becomes if they knew about the classical world, why would they draw it bad? Why would they draw it wrong? Well, the really stupid answer that's also true, but you need to sort of address it explicitly, is because they were making a conscious choice to. They were doing, they were doing an anachronism. Which is interesting because we don't do anachronisms, right? Surely we would never <sighs> in the modern day. When you watch Bridgerton and it's bum, like... Bum, 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 <laughs> bum, That's right. Hamilton, the mo one of the most popular musicals in the entire world is wildly anachronistic, not just because of the sort of con because of the contrivance that nobody in the at the Battle of Yorktown was singing about it or rapping about it. Well, it might have been one guy. There like, might have been one guy rapping in the corner. <laughs> and yet, there was a decision made to portray things in a very modern way. Well, Lin Manuel Miranda, when he was making Hamilton, explicitly cast black and pre predominantly black and Latino actors. Uh, to portray, bluntly, a bunch of overwhelmingly white people. Including, by the way, some not, like, that's, it's not, it, and that's not an insignificant thing to do when you're portraying people who literally owned black people as property. People like fucking Thomas Jefferson. Lima Miranda wasn't doing, wasn't doing that literally to mislead you about the race of the people who were doing those horrible crimes. <laughs> and it wasn't because he didn't know. No, it wasn't because he didn't know. It wasn't he because he thought know. that was actually... Although some people, some people have been tricked. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to a friend of ours recently and she was like, oh yeah, a friend of mine after watched Hamilton then he came up to me and was like, I didn't know George Washington was black. <laughs> totally serious. <laughs> so Linda I'm a you got at least one person, hook, line, and sinker. That Lin sounds like the title of a like the seventh Sharknado. What? Hook, line, and sinker. Ah. Oh! Yeah, and so so he's made a conscious decision to portray something inaccurately to make a point. And the point that he's making, you know, I think a lot of people have just a lot of people have had Hamilton discourse <laughs> over the last few years, but a, the point that he's making is about taking the origin myth of the United States and creating a new origin myth that uh, is historic, is inaccurate to the America of the time, but better reflects the America of the now. Absolutely. He's making a point about who is, who gets to be American, basically. Yeah. And who gets to own that history. Yeah, absolutely. And there's lots of other examples of anachronisms in art, specifically. I mean, one of my favorite examples that I have used when talking to you off air about this very thing is the Baz Luhrmann Romeo and Juliet movie. Yes. Turns out, yeah, it wasn't in L.A. They weren't, like, standing at a gas pump when they had that big shootout. You mean they actually had swords and not, and not guns, guns and sword swords on them? <laughs> <laughs> the 
contrivances. And, they weren't like, dressed like Smash Mouth. Gymnastics that like Baz Luhrmann had to do to keep the original text but make it make sense is, Which is so, so impressive. Awesome. Yeah. And of course, you know, people have been and that, that's that's a great tradition in Shakespeare, I should say, because yeah. of course, people in in Shakespearean history plays are not dressed accurately, in, at least weren't dressed accurately when they were performing in the globe. Yeah. They they were like wearing anachronistic clothing. They weren't like dressed in necessarily dressed in togas. Um No, absolutely not. Yeah, they it's anyway, so the the And point, there was sorry. even sort of there was even sort of like, you know, irony around who was playing the characters because yes. as many of us perhaps know, women in Shakespeare's plays originally were played by men or young boys. Yeah. So Shakespeare loved including things about, you know, mix-ups with love and gender and cross-dressing and disguising yourself as a man. And this would have been extra funny to the audience because they'd be watching a man playing a woman who's playing a man. Yeah, which has which takes on a slightly sort of a slightly less entertaining tint when you think about Othello. But that's yeah. a different story. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah. anachronism is a part of storytelling in the modern era. We kind of accept it, you know. Absolutely. We can accept that these things are these things are wrong. But we understand that the creators of the things, whether it's Lee Manuel Miranda or Baz Luhrmann, uh, are taking artistic license. In order to explore why we do this and why mm -hmm. medieval people did this, I think it's worth sort of asking, why are we telling historical stories? Yes. And I think, as you said, with Hamilton, a lot of it is about claiming ownership over the past. And in fact, I think you could say that by sort of having this recast, sort of retold version of Alexander Hamilton's life, Lin-Manuel Miranda was using that to affirm the idea that people who are Black and Latino and other minorities belong in America today and are a fundamental part of today's America. And are not just American because somebody let them be. They are an integral part of the, of, of the social fabric of America. Yeah, exactly. Rather, rather than people who are sort of tolerated by the white, you know, elite. It turns out that uh, using the past to make a point, and very specifically using the past to construct a sense of group identity, can be incredibly, incredibly powerful, right? Benedict Anderson, who wrote the amazing book Imagined Communities, which is like the definitive, ooh, controversial historians getting annoyed at me at that, uh, definitive book about the sort of the, the origins and spread of nationalism, basically says that like a nation is an example of an imagined community. An imagined community is a is a community where you will never actually meet everybody who is part of that community, but you all sort of share this idea that you're part of the same group. And references to the past are an incredibly powerful binding agent. It's like putting eggs in, in baking, <laughs> right? It, it binds everything together. For example, right? I'm a big fan, a long suffering fan, a big fan of the Scottish national football team. I'm on the Tartan army. Yes, sir, or I can who? boogie. I've never seen you boogie. You saw me boogie last night. Yeah, we were at a Scottish dance. Oh, true. Yeah, and then we then we had then we had uh, too much to eat at ye oldy chicken shop. <laughs> 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 when I watch Scotland play, so they come out to the song uh, Flower of Scotland, which is basically Scotland's unofficial national anthem, I think, at this point. The song that is about the Scottish War of Independence in the Middle Ages. It includes the lyrics that stood against them, crowded Walt's army, wankers, and said. Okay, now in English. <laughs> <laughs> that stood against them, proud Edward's army, that sent them homewards to think again. And then later includes the line Those days are past now, and in the past they shall remain, but we can still rise now and be that nation again. Now, when I hear that, I'm amped. I'm psyched. I'm ready to see us lose 3-1 to fan. Croatia. <laughs> and, and so even though it's a song that I associate almost exclusively with traumatic memories, <laughs> it still gets me amped up because it's like, we can be that nation again. This is just like the Battle of Sterling Bridge. In what year was that? What century? Uh, tail end of the 13th. Yeah. 1297. That's 
pretty powerful. And I think it's something that I think we've all seen be powerful and impactful to people is the idea of one's history and one's heritage, even though this is just sort of a, a very conceptual, very abstract, intangible thing. And imagined, you might say. An imagined past. And I think you need to sort of acknowledge how powerful this process is, because it's something that people in the Middle Ages did too. In fact, it's something that people have been doing since earlier than the Middle Ages. I was in mm -hmm. the British Library a few weeks ago and I saw this great limestone carving that was made for an Egyptian ruler. And it was a list of all the past rulers and the idea was to go back and show how each one inherited power from the other in this long unbroken chain that ends with the current ruler. And medieval people love to do this as well, actually. King lists! Yeah, with king lists and genealogies. So, for instance, they loved making these big, like, rolls of parchment where they would just do a whole list of all of the monarchs in a country. For example, English king lists were a big thing. Um, and the idea was that if you show this long, sort of unbroken lineage, that shows you how legitimate the current monarch is, which is very, mm -hmm. very convenient for the current monarch to draw on this historical power. But there's a small issue, which is that oftentimes, if you go back 500, 600 or more years in a nation's past, there's going to be at least one king <laughs> whose claim to the throne was a little bit less than kosher, mm. we might say. A great example of this is William the Conqueror, who was also known as William the Bastard. So he was the French guy who came over and conquered England and took the English throne from the Anglo-Saxon king. So of course, conquering and bastardry are both sort of undermining factors <laughs> in his ascent to power and his sort of legitimacy. <laughs> He's a bastard, which is bad, and he stole the throne, which is bad. Worse. So, say you're a 13th or a 14th century English monarch, you know, you want a king list. How do you prove that actually your claim to the throne goes all the way back to um, the first English kings? And there's a great example of this on a genealogy roll that I think is like seven meters long. It's like 25 feet-ish for any Americans out there. So it's got like dozens of different people on it. And the whole idea is to make this extended family tree that shows how it is actually just one big, long, unbroken line of monarchs. One big, happy family. So you might say that, okay, William the Conqueror stole the throne, but actually, it turns out that his son Henry, who later became king, married a Scottish princess who shared distant ancestors with the guy that William had deposed. Well, basically, it completely fine. And there's a line that's like probably like five or six or seven feet long, just connecting this one <laughs> random woman who married into, who's the only person, I should say, on this piece of parchment who married into the royal family. And they've added her in and then drawn a line all the way back to the beginning. Mm. And then that makes it look a bit less sort of conspicuous that, huh, suddenly one guy ends and another sort of yeah. bloodline begins. And it's worth saying that it wasn't, of course, just rulers or monarchies that could be legitimized in this way. It was whole sort of ideas and concepts and identities. To return to the French author Chrétien de Troyes, who claimed that no one cared about the ancients anymore, he made that claim in a preface to a poem. So his whole preface goes something like this. I found this ancient Latin book in an old cathedral library. It was so old that we know the tales within it must be true. Greece was the first home of knowledge and chivalry. After that, it was Rome. Now France carries on their legacy of knowledge and chivalry. Hmm. But these days, no one cares about the ancients anymore. Isn't that sad? That's why I took it upon myself to translate this ancient Latin poem to share with you. Now, quick question. Mm -hmm. Was any of that true? No. <laughs> So this was an original poem composed by Chrétien de Troyes. It was never in Latin. He wrote it in French. And this whole Sacre thing bleu. was a conceit, basically, to add weight and to add credibility to his poem. Um, and so, of course, the point isn't really necessarily whether or not exactly what he said is true. The point is that this invocation of the past is very, mm. very powerful, but in order to really make use of it, it's always going to involve some rewriting of the past. Yes. So we need to bring the past up to speed with the present to create that congruity. Because there is an underlying tension 
in the idea of Christian Europeans being direct inheritors of the sort of Roman past, right? And the, the key word there is Christian, <laughs> yes. because Christianity was spread in Europe and the Middle East during the period of the Roman Empire. But A, for quite a long time, the Romans were not fans of it. And B, there was a much older tradition of horrible godless paganism. And so there's an irreconcilable tension between the desire to uh, legitimize oneself by referring to the to the classical past and the incredibly important contemporary sense of being a member of Christendom. Yeah, absolutely. And so what we saw when medieval authors would go through and translate or transcribe Latin texts wasn't just that they would write down what was there, they would also sort of consciously edit and amend and update the text with sort of more contemporary, more Christian appropriate references. They got out their proverbial red pen. Yeah, exactly. And this in my in my mind's eye, yeah. I'm thinking of the you know the old guy from the start of Little Women, the 2019 yeah, yeah, movie, yeah. where he's like, bullshit, bullshit, yeah, bullshit. Yeah, exactly. If it's a, if your main character is a girl, exactly, she has to be at the end. She has to be dead or married. Yep, and it's Ju that. And Julia Caesar is like Saoirse Ronan. <laughs> <laughs> You did what to my writing? <laughs> but yeah, so so a lot of the um, sort of anachronistic depictions of Julius Caesar, for instance, come from books that are translations of Caesar's own memoirs. And so it's, it's not... Like, like, can I just say, it's so baller that he did that. Yeah, It absolutely. was just like, I got some spare time running the, the largest empire <laughs> Europe had ever seen. I'm going to write my memoirs. Yeah. Most people wait till retirement. Yeah, and of course, you know, the idea of taking, like, Caesar's own words and just changing them, it seems a bit sacrilegious, probably, to many of us today, but... It's very uncomfortable. Because there was this acute awareness of the disparities between the past and the present, to medieval authors, it was actually a necessary thing in order to disseminate what they saw as really useful wisdom and knowledge that had been written down by the classical authors. They thought, you know, we need to make this appropriate for a medieval audience. So that's why we need to change some details, because if they're taking a book written by Caesar about his life and his works, and they're tying that to, you know, we should be inspired by Caesar and we should model ourselves on Caesar and the classical worlds, well, then the fact that, yeah, he was a pagan and... Who would have put Christians to the sword. Yeah, and made animal sacrifices to pagan gods, that becomes a little bit sort of sticky. It's a bit... Mm. Yeah, exactly. And so, so a lot of people say that they drew these people, quote, incorrectly, or recounted their stories incorrectly, which is technically true. A lot of people take that as evidence that they weren't aware of the classical worlds um, or of all of the details of the classical world. But actually, what we see is that it's because they were so acutely aware of the classical worlds and its differences with their world that they felt the need to make these changes, you know, and to say, oh, well, Caesar was actually a Christian who had a Christian wedding. Although um, they don't, they don't, I sh we, we should stress that, like, they're not, like, they're not claiming that people were Christians before Christ, exactly, but more just sort of, just kind of leaving it, leaving it open enough. Well, they're, that... yeah, they're doing things like replacing gods, plural, with God, singular. Yeah. yeah. And they're doing... It's just more sort of subtle stuff so that if you weren't necessarily aware of the timeline of, like, late antiquity, you wouldn't raise an eyebrow. Well, yeah, I think a lot of it, some of it is a little bit more sort of conspicuous. I mean, one of my favorite examples of this uh, actually comes from translations of Caesar's work, where um, one of the things that Caesar did was he fought wars with the Gauls, people who... Asterix? Sort of, yeah, who were Asterix, who people who basically... Inhabit, they had Meniers inhabit, and magic potions. <laughs> people who basically... And funny names. People who basically inhabit what's modern-day France. And so if you're a French author and you're trying to, you know, promote Julius Caesar's work, but you have these works where Caesar is saying, oh, yeah, and then... And then I went and killed all the French people. And then I went and killed all the French people. And of course, we know the Roman attitude towards non-Romans was, and they were savage barbarians. Yeah. They were more... And Caesar, of course, isn't recounting everything accurately. But no. he says things about how kind of, like, stupid and gullible um, the Gauls were. Gullible. You know? And... Yes. <laughs> and how he could trick them into doing all sorts of silly things. 
And the French translations of Caesar's works that became popular in the Middle Ages, the authors have gone through and they've actually sort of adapted the role of the Gauls. And they've cut out the parts where Caesar has slaughtered them and tricked them and fooled them and made complete idiots of them. And they've emphasized parts where, oh, in this bit, Caesar found a common enemy. So him and the Gauls both fought the Saxons. And they've added in bits like Caesar saying, oh, and the Gauls are very worthy adversaries, of course. They're a very tough, very noble, very respectable people. And by the way, in doing so, I, should, I think it's very important for us to note that even if we put aside the sort of like, actually Caesar loved the Gauls, he thought they were cool, even the, refer the idea of referencing the Gauls as proto-French people is wildly anachronistic. The name France comes from the Franks, a Germanic people. They speak French, a Romance language descended from Latin, right? The Gauls were Celts. <laughs> they were wildly distinct from French people, but they elided those differences because it was both convenient and important Yeah, to stress continuity. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And especially if you kind of look at what was going on in France when these stories were becoming popular, sort of being a, a noble and a, and a monarch in the Middle Ages, very precarious position, as we've learned. Yes. And so I think that gives some insight into why nobles and monarchs were doing things like creating these king lists to sort of emphasize their own legitimacy. Mm -hmm. And in sort of 13th century France, when these stories were becoming popular, the aristocracy of France, the nobles, were being disenfranchised by the monarch um, and having their sort of lands and titles and powers and other assets stripped away. Part of the transition to an absolute monarchy. Yeah, absolutely. And so this sort of consolidation of power around one figure, it was on all of the aristocrats' minds. And I think that also gives some insight into why the story of Julius Caesar, <laughs> <laughs> kind of a very notable power consolidator, resonated with these people, especially the bit at the end where all of Caesar's friends, the disenfranchised aristocrats, get together and stab him. Yes. And of course, by the way, we should say Caesar is has continues to be a great reference point for that exact point well into Shakespeare's time. Shakespeare's plays were written in the political context of Elizabeth I, who had her own legitimacy problems, shall we say, as a female ruler. Yeah. And a lot of Shakespeare's plays like Beth as well, are kind of anti-regicide propaganda. <laughs> yeah. They're about, like, killing the king is bad, actually. Yeah, I mean, they're kind of kicking these historical figures around like footballs, you know, fighting over them, trying to establish what actually was the point of Julius Caesar's life. Was it monarchs good? Was it monarchs bad? Which is something, by the way, that no historian would ever do. In case you couldn't tell, that was sarcasm. <laughs> But well, I, let's put a pin in that. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. And I think that, you know, leads us into the fact that really we didn't have the same concept of history in the Middle Ages as like a distinct field that's defined by specific sort of attributes. Mm -hmm. And really what we see with these figures like Caesar and like Alexander the Great. Oh, they, they loved Alexander the Great. They loved Alexander the Great. And, you know, with this sort of attempt to medievalize them or modernize them for their own times and to give them things like Christian weddings and make them go to church and make them be crowned by popes and things like that. And to sort of rewrite even the narratives in line with their own values was that they weren't really being used as historical sources. They were, as they were by Shakespeare, being used as literary figures who were kind of I would say in some ways entirely distinct from the actual historical counterpart. So this isn't really, when we see a medieval drawing of Julius Caesar or Alexander the Great, and really when we go see a Shakespeare play, for example, about Caesar, it's not really- Or Alexander Hamilton. Exact, or Alexander Hamilton. Like we've said, it's not really about that person as they lived. It's about a literary version of that figure who's a device, who's a vessel really for a message. So I think one is coming at it from sort of the wrong place if one is saying, why didn't they do this, you know, quote, correctly? Mm -hmm. Because that's never really been the point, has it? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting you should mention literary devices, uh, to put it mildly, because 
I think when we when we when we hear about the uh, when we hear about the people who are sort of tasked with transmitting the past into the present and then the future, you know what we would now call historians, and we think about them consciously rewriting stuff to fit the present day. I think that makes us a little bit queasy. There's something very uncomfortable about that, isn't there? I think so. I think we're fine with Shakespeare or Lin Manuel Miranda or artists doing that. But I think in terms of historiography, people who are writing about the past and presenting it as fact without the sort of artifice of literature, I think we're, we 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 feel weird about that, don't we? We want it to be obvious. We want a reliable neutral narrator. Yeah. And the thing is, that's a very modern idea. So modern history as a discipline, as practiced to this day, really originates, just a heads up, this is going to be the most controversial thing I ever say Let's on this podcast. Go. It's going to be so much worse than that time I spent five episodes doing an elaborate, not very funny joke about potatoes. That we still get comments that we about. we still get, I got one yesterday, I was like, no. <laughs> I explained in the episode, it's a joke. Anyway, this is going to be my hottest take yet, right? Modern history, as we practice it, basically originates in uh, in the Enlightenment and the sort of ideas about empiricism that, like, people like David Hume are throwing around. It was right? about the 17th century, right? Yeah, yeah. 17th, 18th century. Um, that worldview is kind of based on two assumptions, right? The first of those assumptions is that there exists a singular truth about the past. Basically, that we should act as though we can just hop in the TARDIS with David Tennant and go to Rome in the first century, and we, could, we would be able to observe that, right? That the past happened, right? And it's, it's real. The, it, does that make any sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because it's going to get trippier from here. <laughs> so I need to know that I'm on solid footing, right? So that so so the past exists, and we just kind of need to find our way to it. And that's the job of the historian. The second assumption is that we can actually do that. That we can actually, if we had enough evidence, we would be able to figure out exactly what happened. In this assumption, that the historian is basically Poirot, right? Poirot always finds the killer, right? Because he has his little crécelles. I think I'm more of a Columbo. You didn't watch, uh, mate. Every every uh, weekday, like nine p.m. ITV three, David Suchet. <laughs> oh, he was killing it. My approach to history is more like um, Kyle MacLachlan in um <laughs> in uh, Twin Peaks. <laughs> I just like, um, I'm like, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to throw knives at a board and I'm going to divine the truth based on that. Cool. Well, it's funny you should say that. So that's the assumption. Those are the assumptions that govern history as it's practice. So the, the, job of, the job of the historian is to be Poirot, right? A neutral observer who absorbs all the facts and then comes to a rational, reasoned conclusion about what the truth actually is. Now, that's a fun idea in theory, but in the 20th century, a whole bunch of historians who are too numerous to name, it's the important points to know. <laughs> and again, God, they're going to crucify me for this. I promise you, this is so simplified. It gets so much worse. I could start talking, if I really wanted to get into this, I could start talking about like brains in jars and shit. <laughs> it gets worse. Epistemology and ontology just get crazy the deeper you go. So a historical movement that extremely broadly we can call uh, postmodernists comes along in the 20th century and says, gosh, that's cute. It's look at you people. You're so adorable with your, with your empirical truth. And your your little detective glasses and your little Sherlock Holmes hat, but unfortunately, you're barking up the wrong tree. The postmodernists problematize those assumptions, right? The first thing they say, even if objective truth exists, and some of them don't even believe that does, um, what makes an event historically significant is not 
necessarily the raw events of the thing. It's how it's interpreted. So, okay, a guy swung a sword and cut off a guy's head. But what does that actually mean in context? Without understanding the reasons he did it, or what the guy being slashed at thought was happening to him, or what he, or where he thought he was going when he died, the event has no weight. It has no meaning. Right? Therefore, even the things that are empirically true, right, have multiple truths attached to them. It's like that great Lionel Hutz quote from The Simpsons. There's the truth and the truth. <laughs> if there's one thing you take from that, it's that. Um, secondly, a postmodernist would say, even if you could know that, even if, you, even if there was a singular truth, you're never going to be able to find it. Because of all the factors that we've already mentioned, just the sheer passage of time destroys things like parchment, like Greece Rise of the Pink Ladies, no longer streaming on Prime Video. Yeah, history isn't actually Poirot. It's not forensics. It's paleontology. Basically, you walk around and then you find a big bone next to a different big bone, and then you try to find out what kind of dinosaur that was. Except you then find out that uh, they're not actually from the same skeleton. They're actually from millions of years apart and they never met. <laughs> right? Yeah. This is tricky for the historian, isn't it? Because in order to sort of, you know, have any, like, legitimacy and any credibility, you know, what happens to the... What happens to your legitimacy and credibility when you say there's no way of knowing the truth, you know? It's impossible. Well, I'll tell you what happens. Bad stuff, basically. The, the postmodernist would say, actually, not only is it futile trying to understand, get to what the singular truth is, all right? In fact, it's actively trying to, trying to be neutral is actively dangerous because not everybody's interpretation of what happened in the past is treated equally in the sources. The reason why they say history is written by the winners is not literally because it's always the winners of X battle that get to write the history. Like we have lots of histories by, um, you know, by the losers. Well, yeah, as we've talked about prison literature. Yeah, huge exactly. Huge genre. Exactly. Well, yeah, I think it's, you know, we'll never be able to be neutral mm -hmm. or to be fully truthful. And yeah. so it's so much more important to, at the very least, acknowledge one's biases or you know, to not present what one's saying as such. Yeah, no, exactly. Like, because everybody is, everybody, even the people, this is not necessarily as far as I'd go, but a postmodernist might say, my straw man postmodernist might say, not, uh, that everybody, that, that even people who are trying to be neutral are still swimming in their own sea of cultural references and understandings about the world. And the only way to free yourself from that is to accept you, you, you can only understand the multiple the multiplicity of truths. Yeah. And you mentioned you mentioned that you know that that medieval historiography that medieval historians weren't writing quote unquote objective history they were writing literature. There's a great quote from the historian Hayden Wright who says that history is no less a form of fiction than the novel is a form of historical representation. Wow. Yeah, that, we're getting deep. That boggles the brain. It does a little bit. But yeah, it's it's I think it's a good point because I think it it emphasizes I think the the fact that you know medieval people weren't medieval people had a very different relationship with the concept of truth in that the idea of truth didn't really come into play at all when they were writing these histories. So there was no aspiration to tell the truth and there was no belief on the part of the reader that they were hearing the truth which which you know again like you can feel weird about that because we are kind of raised in this world where reason history is about finding the singular truth right but imagine yourself into the shoes of a medieval person for a second right you know two things that are absolutely true right that are in direct conflict with each other um one god is real <laughs> <laughs> obviously there, there are people who sort of were less religious than others in the medieval world, but like your default assumption is that God is real, right? Assumption number two, you are the inheritors of a fairly problematic past. 
So in a world where you have to, where it is imperative to, right, in a world where the point of these, of this genre of history is to sort of teach people things, right? It's not necessarily to like recount things literally, but to, to teach people lessons about how to be a good king or a, or a good ruler or, or where they, or where they came from as a people. So ask yourselves, which is more important? Sticking to a, a, a an object, an ob, uh, sticking to an idea of objectivity that's probably BS anyway, or just massaging the details a little bit round the corners so that the two foundational ideas of your civilization don't like collapse in <laughs> on each other and cause like complete breakdown of like the legitimacy of the form of government that you have. Yeah, and your spiritual world. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And I think it, it definitely speaks to like the enduring power of sort of the classical worlds and of the ancient mm. sort of, you know, thinkers and ancient leaders that people were so keen to adapt their stories and to take their stories. They and, really wanted and to make it fit. Use them to, you know, propel themselves forwards. Mm. So yeah, I think even asking were people thinking of this as the truth, you know, did people think that this version of, you know, Caesar's life was the truth? You know, I think that's maybe not even like a very interesting question because these people thought that they already knew the truth and so everything else would just kind of fall into place. Yeah, once again, when God is real, <laughs> like provably real. <laughs> It's exactly. uh your whole your whole way of thinking about like again truth and knowledge is different. Yeah, especially because even though medieval people engaged with the concept of truth and you know asked philosophical questions about the truth in fact the middle ages was when sort of the western study of truth really kicked off the idea of truth was so indelibly deeply linked to the idea of god and to religion mm. that every that that you know it was really important to sort of you know adapt things to fit these religious ideals and to make sure that the truth as it was told or as it was claimed to make sure the narrative that was told reflected religious ideals and so i think that's also a really big part of why these historical works from you know ancient greece and ancient rome were kind of infused with a little Jesus. bit of Jesus. A little sprinkling. Yeah, and it gives us these really interesting sort of, you know, situations. I think one of my favorite ones is the Beowulf manuscript, <gasps> which is, you know, uh, it's an Anglo-Saxon story and it's it predates Christianity, but we get this really great sort of... Um, I don't know, it's it's like it's like past the parcel, you know, like peeling back layers of people who have transmitted this story and pasted on their own layers and layers and layers uh, of their own beliefs and their own sort of, you know, identities. And then we, as, you know, people interested in history, get to try to peel those back and see what's underneath. And no, we're not going to find the objective truth, but we're going to learn a little bit about what these different cultures valued, what was important to them. Well, and exactly. I think that's really cool. You know, the 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 the, the truth about um, being a historian, writing about history, is that you always, unfortunately, leave a little bit of yourself on the page, even just in the thing, even just in the uh, stuff that you choose to write about, yeah. like. <laughs> I mean, I didn't want to go there, but like, uh, you know, why did you make a weird medieval guy's Twitter account? Yeah, it's, it's exactly. a wild thing to do. Probably tells you a little bit about you as a person. In fact, quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it says a lot about the degenerates that follow me. <laughs> 700,000 of them. <laughs> that they're so interested in it. We love you really. Yeah, exactly. So just, you know, like, you see medieval people, you know, don't like when you see when you see medieval people like draw Caesar wrong, it's kind of a break. You yeah, know? and okay, here's my spicy take. Oh dear, so no, I, think, I don't think I can handle more spice. I don't have Guy Fieri in me today. That's okay. Next time we'll Guy Fieri, but that's not a promise for now. Um, I'll Guy Fieri if I have to. Fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Don't make me guy fear. Um, so anyways, so I think one of the reasons why people today believe that those who lived in the Middle Ages were completely ignorant of the classical past was because they created, um, in large part, you know, very little by way of things that, you know, were sort of mimicked the classical past, as opposed to, for instance, the Renaissance and in the, the 16th and even late 15th centuries when people were creating architecture and marble sculptures in sort of the style of the Greeks and the Romans and um, sort of using, you know, sort of promoting this idea that we should be mimicking the past and mimicking the classical worlds. And we even see that today. And I think that's a big part of why people today think that medieval people were ignorant of the past is because we value the aesthetics of classical architecture and of the classical worlds, you know, columns. And Are you talking about anyone in particular? Would you like to name anyone? And white marble sculptures <laughs> that have never been painted. And em big, big global empires where yeah. you can promote your system of values. Yeah. And I think it's not to say that there weren't these tendencies in the medieval world, but I think what's really interesting to me is that for them there was much less of this sort of tendency to gravitate back towards, you know, this aestheticized idea of the past. They were trying to bring the past up to speed with the present. And so I think that in some ways, maybe that's a much more sort of progressive, intelligent approach of, you know, rather than saying we need to go back, saying they need to come forwards and we need to bring them forward into history with us. So, yeah. I think I think it's, you know, who's who's really ignorant and regressive, you know, the people who were pioneering their own style of art and architecture and their own aesthetics and trying to sort of, you know, bring the past with them or, you know, people today who or are those people who will post <laughs> one picture of a of a 17th century uh, neoclassical building next to a picture of a brutalist building and say, what did we forget? We've lost the lost art of buildings. <laughs> Why exactly. can't we make things beautiful anymore? <laughs> Shut up. Yeah. Stop posting that shit. It's the same. You you post the same thing every day. Yeah. Exactly. I'm sick of it. Exactly. So I'm doing a. We're gonna do a whole episode on you, you people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna. I'll, I'll, Olivia hasn't signed this off. I'm announcing it now. <laughs> Soft launch. Yeah, I think that's a hard launch. <laughs> I guess, yeah, my point is, if every building we've built for the past 500 years has a Doric column on it, then does that, you know, Have does that mean does that mean that people who are ma making Gothic architecture for the first time were the ignorant ones, or are we the ignorant ones? I mean, that's a simplistic way of putting it, but I think it, you know, it, it shows, I think, a a very strong originality and a very deep belief in sort of the values and the ideas that were unique and original to their culture, to the extent that it can be an original idea. <laughs> but yeah, so that's my conclusion, is medieval people were more woke than us. Thank you for coming back, coming with us as we peel back all of those layers and get to the soft, meaty onion underneath. That's exactly how I was going to put it. Wait, for real? No. <laughs> <laughs> I was not, believe it or not, going to utter the phrase soft, meaty onion. <laughs> um, Donkey! Yeah. Where's Fiona? Fiona. <laughs> This is a stupid show. <laughs> All right. Anyways, um, thank you so much for listening. Um, uh, yeah, thanks so much to everyone for all the five star reviews. You guys are the real stars. Thank you to everyone who has already pre ordered the Weird Medieval Guys book. You guys are my heroes. Um, if you haven't pre ordered it already, what are you doing? Turn off this podcast. Go to your book supplier of choice. If you're um, in the UK, you can go on Amazon or on Blackwell's. If you're on the U in the US, go to blackwells.co.uk. Type in Weird Medieval Guys and 
buy that thing. Pre-order it. Um, it's so good. I like I as one of the like three people in the world who's actually seen it. It's a it's a bit of a tour de force. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not being paid to say that. <laughs> Genuinely. I think it's a it's a wonderful object and you've done a fantastic job. Your it. your and rates are too high for me to afford. Yeah, no, I mean it's 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 a wonderful wonderful um book that you've made and uh, I th I think if you, you know, if you like the Twitter account, you'll love this book. If you like this show, you'll love this book. It's just full of like wonderful little fun facts and the uh that little weird medieval guy's flavor that Olivia always brings to everything. It has so many guys in it. It has 256 images, I would know, because I found them all myself. I curated them for you guys, and you're gonna love them. God, she's so cool. Buy her book! And follow us on Twitter. Yes. I'm at Olivia underscore underscore MS, and as always, you can follow Weird Medieval Guys at Weird Medieval on Twitter. And I am at Aaron P. Tappers on Twitter. And? I don't have anything to promote. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron is kind of a commodity unto himself. I just, I, you know, I bring the spice. I'm going to invest in the Aaron market. Oh, I wish somebody would. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Aaron's up this quarter. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Till next time. We fly.